So the next speaker we have is uh, uh, Professor Dr. Nohayati, who is basically uh, from the Department of Built Environment, Faculty of Built Department Department of Building Survey, Faculty of Built Environment. Dr. Nohayati is basically holds a degree from the University of Science Malaysia in Housing Building and Planning, majoring architect and obtain a Master of Science in Integrated Design Construction Management and from the University of Technology Mara. And basically, then after that, she went on to pursue her PhD from the University of Reading in UK under the Indoor Environment and Energy Research Group. So currently, basically, what she's going to explain to us is well-being and the indoor physical environment during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think she's the best person to do it. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Prof. Victor, Dr. Marzuki, and also Dr. Rida for the first uh, presentation just now. So I think uh, it's a good thing that I'm being placed as the second presenter in between the two engineers so that uh, uh, obviously uh, not going to talk too much on the technical aspects. But uh, more or less, I will be talking slightly on the natural ventilation towards the uh, last final, uh, last two of my final slide, uh, end of the slides. But uh, more of the slides are basically talking about the indoor physical environment and the well-being of the healthcare workers, which I think at this point of time, uh, um, it is a good, it's a high time for the healthcare providers, the management or the bosses to actually look into this and, and not uh, only looking into the patients, but also to look into the healthcare workers because they are as important as the patients because patients do bring in money, but uh, the healthcare workers uh, actually needs to do all the um, job to make sure that it's productive and efficient. So. Uh, moving on, I'm just going to explain about the topic for discussion. So I'll just talk briefly on the hospital and the importance of healthcare workers. And then we'll go on to the issues faced during the pandemic crisis. Then I'll talk a bit on the healthcare workers productivity. And the final bit, which I think is very important for all um, the healthcare providers to be aware uh, of this uh, situation so that the well-being of the healthcare workers are being uh, taken care of. Uh, taken care of. So, as we all know, hospital is a complex building. It is not like a shopping complex. It's not like an offices. It's not even like an education institution. Because in hospitals, you have you know almost everything in there. You have services. You have um, restaurants, cafe. You have uh, surgery surgery rooms, operation rooms all sorts of difficult and complex uh, uh, facilities and spaces. And I think the most, uh, when, when I did my architecture studies, I think the most um, serious work or uh, the most difficult task for us to start designing is to, to, to actually design on those. Uh, because you have to really look into very, the tiny, uh, the teeny weeny bits of hospital uh, facilities that you need to actually offer. So hospital represent a uniquely complex environment because it accommodates multiple functions and differs from other commercials and or residential buildings. Therefore, the indoor uh, occupants are at a higher risk of health and of course, because you have patients in there, so it has a higher risk of health symptoms and actually can actually, you know, um, uh, uh, transmit to the healthcare workers as well. And the relationship between the physical environment well-being and the comfort of occupants may vary between hospital departments. But the hospitals not only is you know uh, provides wards and also uh, a base uh, room base for uh, patients, but it has different multiple uh, uh, departments where you have uh, intensive unit, you have general wards. It's like a totally different thing to actually look into with different needs and different kind of patients. And therefore, management must also take an active part in defining the physical environment for conducive working environment to all healthcare workers because chronic stress impacts work workplace well-being. Okay, so now I'm sure you've seen all these pictures throughout this one year, 2020. We know that the medical workers and hospital staff tasked with what seems to be the biggest challenges in their profession and failure is definitely not an option at the current moment. So as the number of COVID-19 cases in the country spikes, 
the frontliners are facing increasingly long hours, fatigue, and mounting of frustrations. I think only the frontliners, the, only the healthcare workers uh, can actually explain about this. We can only see, but we cannot feel it. So uh, therefore, I think this is very, very important for me to at least um, give uh, an indication or just to say uh, things that I can actually help in, in terms of just giving some awareness to the healthcare providers that uh, the physical environments are basically very important for the healthcare workers to be productive. These um, ex uh, issues that healthcare workers experience during their response to the COVID-19 crisis. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any research that is basically done in Malaysia uh, asking questions um, or having a detailed studies on how healthcare workers um, experience throughout the pandemic. Uh, maybe there are some research, but I've, I couldn't find it. Maybe it's too confidential. But this, uh, be, uh, this uh, study has uh, been done in in China. So this, these are some of the uh, quote and unquote of some nurses and also some doctors. OK, so what um, one of them, what one of the, the several remarks is that to protect other medics, we are fearful of being infected. Anyone who coughs in the office causes panic. I think this. Uh, I think this one also happens to us in the office. You know, if one person coughs, one person, one person sneezes, everybody will be looking at each other. Not, not sure whether he is actually, you know, just sneezing because of dust or is he actually affected. So I think this happens to everyone, and in. In the early stage of this pandemic, I think this is what is being fearful. So if one is infected, all medics in the unit are in danger. Then the unit will be paralyzed. Very true enough. So the second one, I must hold the medicine close to the face shield to read the words on it. I am very anxious and irritable because I have so much work to do, but I can't see well. I'm sure when, when you have this um, uh, plastic cover in front of your face, it's like wearing your spectacles and having your mask on. When you breathe in and out, you tend to have this uh, condensation and you have this uh, you know, evaporation and you get this, um, uh, you know, a bit uh, blurry with your glasses or the pl plastic band. So yeah, this will also affect the productivity in terms of reading and giving a suitable or appropriate medicine to the patients. Then. Moving on to extend the use of protective suits. We do not eat or drink during the six hours shift to avoid using the food. So every hospital does not have enough supplies and we are trying our very best to save them. Another, another person said, because we were weighed down by the PPE, our movement was clumsy and the protective goggles become blurred quickly which made the work much more difficult. And another person said, wearing the whole set of PPEs is very uncomfortable. I can imagine. I have difficulty breathing and feeling very hot and my heart rate speeds up. We keep on stretching and the clothes are all soaked. So looking and uh, uh, you know, reading all these things, even though we're not in the situation, we're not in the PPE. We can actually, you know, see the difficulties that the healthcare workers uh, actually faced. Just a, a few more. Okay. When a patient with an infection disease dies, the body is wrapped in several layers of cloth, packed into two bags, which are sprayed with this. It is a little hard to accept this form of death. Okay. Especially when it is your relative. It is patients that you see every every day that die, it may not be related to you, but it gives you a bit of, you know, sudden on, on the way on how it ended the life. So we have many patients, but limited protective suits, and we cannot tolerate wearing protective suits for long hours. So I can only focus on important problems and I'm less concerned with other issues. So I feel sorry about that. So all this experiences has actually um, uh, uh, create a fluctuated, you know, fluctuation in terms of the moods 
looking into their patient's conditions daily. And it actually goes from February till now. So, um, you know, when, when the healthcare people, medical people, nurses, doctors, consultants, they're happy when and feel great with uh, when the patient's condition improved. However, when they tried their very best, but patient's condition showed no improvement or deteriorated, they felt depressed and had a deep sense of powerlessness. So when you look into all these experiences, you actually, you know, feel uh, how, how the, it can actually lead to mental illness. Uh, uh, hopefully, there's, no, uh, hopefully not, not that, you know, critical, but uh, uh, slowly can actually affect, you know, how the healthcare workers actually deal with all this throughout the few months uh, coming to one year now. So that's why it is very important for the healthcare to be taken uh, care of and to make sure that the physical environment that they will be facing daily in their working lives for the next few years with the uh, should be actually uh, taken care of uh, so that uh, the work quality life balance as well as the uh, healing environment, not only to the patients, but also to be taken important for the healthcare workers as well. All right. So, as I've mentioned just now, hospitals should be uh, is a complex uh, building. Therefore, it should be rated as a high performance building. Because if it's a complex building and it's not high performance, it's going to be it's going to fail. Everything is going to fail in terms of service, in terms of uh, the productivity, in terms of the workflow. All sorts of things will fail if the building is not a high performance building. So. One of the reasons or one of the main important aspects to ensure that a high performance building is uh, being designed is to enhance the staff efficiency and to maintain patient's healing process. OK, so therefore the physical environment again works and plays a vital role in employees productivity. So research indicates that staff well-being, productivity and satisfaction are linked with a hospital's physical environment. In particular, the aspects that are determined during the early stage, early design stage of building life cycles. So, uh, hopefully, that after this, if there's a new hospitals that will be uh, designed, uh, things on physical environment taking care, uh, taking uh, high consideration from the design uh, aspects, and also asking on the needs from also the healthcare workers rather than looking into the patients only so it has to play it has to be hand in hand with regards to designing a hospital so throughout the COVID-19 pandemic if there's anyone that's working harder than everyone is definitely our frontliners especially those working in healthcare right I'm just going to explain slightly uh, on the productivity okay so there's two terms in terms of effectiveness and efficiency so effectiveness is doing the right things and concern about the achievement and outputs, but efficiency is doing things right and concern on managing the resources and inputs. Okay, uh, this is basically part of the physical environment as well. It can be improved by looking into the circulation. One of the examples that I can give you today. There's a lot of examples, but uh, it's going to take uh, a long hours to explain that. I'm just going to give you an example on improving the circulation and spaces. So I'm just going to move on to the studies that has been carried out in the UK in the intensive care unit in one of the hospitals in the in London, I think. Yeah. So uh, studies were done to look into the space syntax, walking distance and walking path of the doctors, of the consultants, nurses, nurses in charge and also the runners to see for every daily routine each day, how many kilometers are they actually uh, walking around and about the uh, units that they're attached to, okay? So if you look to this hospital, it's, it's quite small and it's an intensive unit with um, 35 beds only. And you have nurses to patient at a ratio of one to one, that's in UK. Not sure how it works in Malaysia, 
I'm sure in uh, government hospitals, uh, it's, it's not gonna, it's, it may not be like this. I'm not sure. I hope it can be like this. But if you can see the the space, um, I'm just gonna okay. So if you can see, these are colors of lines which the roads of the uh, individual, you know, for the green one is the cons uh, consultants. Okay, the purple is the nurses. So you will see that it, it actually scribbles around and around here. Okay, so all these things they measure by just having a chip on that is, is attached to the batch on each nurses, each consultants that are actually on duty on that day. So it comes out to be that the doctors have uh, actually walked 2.24 kilometers in a day, not that long route, okay? Consultants 4.37, nurses 4.21. And if you can see the runner, I'm not sure the runner, I think the runner is also the nurses, but it's more of the junior nurse that actually do the, you know, taking notes and taking all sorts of things, I, I guess. So it's actually 12.8 kilometers. So these are work, uh, walking path and also walking distance uh, that is being taken daily. And if you see the routine, uh, you will see that you know with the consultants uh, more on the conversation and the patient care and the uh, and the computer work. So these are things that I think it would be good if we can actually have this kind of uh, research being done in our hospitals as well to see if our nurses, our doctors, our consultants are actually walking this far in a day. You know, because if you can actually have a design, we can actually reduce the routes, but with uh, with uh, if, uh, eff effective, uh, you know, way of working, it will reduce the time of them working, walking uh, the whole day. So that's with the walking distance. Also, there's a space syntax analysis on the spatial analysis of the watts layout. This is basically talk, uh, looking into the observant, uh, observation of you know, uh, how, how the routes and the rooms are basically designed so that um, it can be actually observed and being monitored without, without actually walking too much on certain areas. This is basically the integration of spatial and to see the depth in visi the visibility. And if, it, and if you look here, a is where perhaps a nurse is there. So observing whichever that can actually be seen without walking. OK, so uh, these are things uh, which is related to um, productive and uh, effective and efficient way of uh, the uh, improving the workflow and the work pathway. All right, moving on to the physical environment factors. There's a few, there's, there's quite a lot actually, but uh, it's very, basically it's not that difficult to implement or to apply, but it, uh, it, it can be quite costly if it's, if it's a renovation work, but if it's being designed earlier on before the building is constructed, looking into all these sorts of things with healthcare and not only with patients, I think the well-being of the healthcare will be actually taken care of. So the first one is artwork and healing process, and also the light and views, auditory environment, musical sound and therapy, landscape. So I'm just gonna explain very, very briefly on each of these aspects, okay? So artwork. So nothing is more sickening than watching a blank wall and wait for something. So if you always you know, look through a blank wall, white blank wall, so you can't see anything. It's like uh, uh, something is not right and you feel bored. So human well-being is achieved through a series of open visual interactions. Benefit of art in the healing environment leading to reduced hospital stays by one day. This is a research that has been carried out to patients. Reduction in the amount of painkillers taken by patients when art was in the environment. So these are all some of the research that has been carried out that gives impact to the patients when you have artwork as a healing process. So it can also be, uh, you know, uh, also sense of wayfinding, you know, looking about the artwork of a signages with the color. And if you see here, this is a signage of river, and this is the color of the wall showing that you're at the right path. And the next one 
is light and views indoor and outdoor. So especially to nurses uh, who are actually working long hours, not only with the patients, but not only uh, uh, this can be applied to patients, but it also important for the nurses. You know, working uh, throughout the day, if you can't see the views outside, you can't see the sun, you can't see the daylight, you can only you will only use the artificial lighting throughout the week. It's uh, something that uh, you know needs to be considered because you need to see the daylight, you need to see the views outside for you to uh, at least you know come and also have a different um, environment uh, during your working hours. So nothing can challenge the healing potential of na natural lights within a given space. So 78% believe that daylight has many direct health benefits, including faster recovery and a reduced length of stay for patients. Ultra light, ultraviolet light enhances healing by decreasing fatigue, increasing the release of endorphins, and promote emotional well-being. And high intensity of artificial lights appear to decrease errors in medication preparation and work strain. So of course you need both natural lighting, daylighting, and also artificial lighting. And now we have a very new technologies with LED lighting, with colored lighting, which I think if you're in this situation, it's really going to be very soothing coming to the office, looking at different colors. Although you have, you know, lots of works, it can actually balance a bit. So at least uh, reduce your stress or something. It will be nice to have this. OK, so there's another one, which is auditory environment. Interruptions on, on uh, and ongoing noise can have real implications on work productivity and sleep quality of patients. Not only for patients, I think if you're working long hours with all sorts of noise, you get annoyed. Main sources of high noise levels are medical devices, building materials and curtains, and also conversations. OK, so healthcare workers perceive high noise levels related to feeling sick at the end of the day. OK, so I'm just going to show you an example. Uh, Hello. OK, listen to the difference. Hello. 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 You can see the difference Hello. of Hello. and preparation points, which gives an impact to the environment. Found. Yeah. So another one is the musical sound for therapy. Now, during the lunch hour or during the break hours of the uh, of the healthcare workers, I think it's good to have you know music therapy, or you know uh, sometimes when you have this uh, Quranic reading, Quran reading is so also good because it's be, uh, giving you calm and um, you know uh, reduce your stress, fear, so that uh, you have a healthy and a work life balance throughout the day. OK, then another one is landscape and therapeutic gardens. OK, so research has also shown that viewing natural vegetation, water and other natural elements can improve stress and the well-being in healthcare environments and activities can be all sorts of things outside in the garden. So I'm going to show you one of the slides which one of my colleagues in the Faculty of Built Environment has actually done about the therapeutic gardens. Show. So just a few minutes of slides so that you can see what has been done and something which is a good activities to be carried out during the breaks to release stress.
Okay, these are all works carried out by Dr. Hazrina, one of my colleagues in the Faculty of Built Environment. Okay, moving on, there's also architectural design impact, which I think related to the explanation on this partial syntax just now on the work path and also the walking distances. That is also part of the architectural design impact on how the design that is being carried out earlier on can actually impact and give effect to the efficiency of the working productivity. So apart from that, uh, design what layouts and nurses stations uh, to reduce staff walking and fatigue, and then using materials that limit allergies or potential of toxins for hospital space construction. Uh, we have the indoor air quality management during the construction, you know, all things that needs to look into so that we don't bring in bad uh, air quality during the construction and then will further, uh, you know, uh, deteriorate all sorts of uh, quality in terms of the environment later on when it's already being vacant. So reduce contamination rate of interiors fe uh, interior features. With having COVID, uh, you know, throughout the years, I think it's best for the hospitals to actually have a uh, sink or, you know, or tap, wash, wash taps rather than having sanitizer most of it uh, at, at most spaces. I think to have a tap at certain distance would also gives a good impact to the healthcare workers. You don't have to have the tap that can actually be function using your, your hands, but you can just tap. There's a, there's a, a, a lot of innovative steps. You can use your hands or your tap. So you don't have to uh, use your uh, hands so that it does not contaminate the the tap to open up the water and then create environments that stimulate the mind in order to create pleasure, creative and satisfaction and enjoyment. Throughout the day, the healthcare workers, the doctors, nurses have actually worked really, really hard, you know, working and trying to save a patient's life, trying to do the best uh, of, uh, of whatever that they have to do. I think the break session that they can, that they have like just a uh, half an hour to uh, one hour, is the best you know, time for them to have this kind of environment uh, to, uh, to look away from the patient's problem, look away from other you know, aspects, in, just to rest and uh, you know, relax uh, uh, for a bit. And most of the restrooms that we have in hospitals are basically in the centre, which you don't have or basically at the side, which which sometimes does not have windows for them to look out. It's in, in the middle of the building or it's in between rooms. So what you can actually do is basically, you don't have to have windows, but you, you can actually introduce nature. You can introduce things which uh, represent nature uh, around the room and you can create activities or whatever that you, you can to actually uh, give a different environment settings while not uh, taking care of the patients. So that we have color and its impact to the environment. Obviously, uh, with different colors, gives you different psychological effects and also cleanliness and ease of maintenance. Okay, it's, it's very important, especially during the COVID uh, pandemic season, and especially to departments uh, or wards that have uh, con contagious uh, patients, then access to social support as well. Having said that, you know, uh, healthcare workers are uh, being tired, uh, they can be mentally stressed. You need to have the access to so social support as well. So the final one, which is going to be on the thermal comfort and a personal control. So when we talk about thermal comfort, uh, it, it talks about the ventilation as well. So I, I'm not going to talk on the mechanical ventilation because I think Prof. Yao will be explaining on the mechanical ventilation. So I'm just going to talk um, very briefly on the natural ventilation. OK, so there's a lot of things uh, when you talk about thermal comfort. Sometimes there's a ward that needs really, really cold air, a uh, cold temperature, uh, operation theater, and some works um, are just, you know, having natural ventilation, which some uh, knowing that Malaysia has a, a quite a high, uh, high temperature outside. So bringing in a lot of, you know, hot and humid air coming in is also not a comfort. Uh, feeling. So uh, I'm just going to explain on how it affects the COVID uh, during COVID with the natural ventilation. Obviously, I think most research says that you, when you have natural ventilation, 
it is one of the good or uh, the uh, energy efficient way to actually flush out the the um, airborne transmission. So if you can see here, this is the airborne transmission in the room. So with the windows open, and you need to have an extractor here because it doesn't work with only one window. It will work if you have a high ventilation because if you see here, the only way natural ventilation can work in a space to flush out the air, uh, the airborne transmission, to flush out the contaminants is by having high ventilation rate. You need to know the flow direction, if it's correct direction or is going straight to the healthcare workers or it goes straight to the next uh, patient. So you need to know the flow direction and you also need to know the airflow pattern. If it's a, you know, a mixing flow pattern, if it's a displacement ventilation, so all sorts of things that you have to take into account when you, want, you need to use natural ventilation. So having only one window without any other openings may not increase the ventilation rate. So if you see here, airborne transmission of COVID-19 outbreak in the indoor environment is likely when the ventilation rate is less than three liter per second per person. So you need to have higher or double the, the rate or a, in a minimum guideline says 12 air change rate per hour. Okay, so with the fan, it is good because it has uh, it increases the ventilation rate. But again, when you have the fan, you have the windows open. It has to make sure that the airborne transmission or the contaminants are being flushed out to a proper channel and not to, you know, uh, maybe there's a window or uh, opening here leading to the next room. If it's being flushed out to the next room, then it doesn't fit the purpose. OK, so the location of the outlet and inlet is very important with regards to the uh, natural ventilation in uh, wards or in any areas where the uh, airborne transmission is going to occur. OK, so if you see here, this is uh, not this is definitely not at a hospital, but you can actually use this strategy for you to use uh, for you uh, to go back home, you know, in your house when you go back, not knowing if you actually have uh, bringing in a contaminants or not yourself. Hopefully not. But this is one of the ways that you can actually have in indoor areas in your house to actually uh, flush out because once the virus escape into uh, into the air inside a building, you have only two choice. Bring in fresh air from outside or remove the virus from air inside the building. OK, so you need to have windows open at most of the time, but preferably early, early in the morning because it's not the temperature is not that high yet. OK, when the windows are open, it is really good that you can have a cross ventilation. OK, so if you can see here, there's windows. There's also a window fans. I know uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't think most houses now have the window fan, but in old houses, they have like an extractor fan attached to the wall. So this extractor fan is a really good uh, uh, element that can actually suck the air. Fresh air comes in and it's being extracted out or it can be from the cross ventilation or you can also use the air purifier which have power filters. So this is another illustration. For, for you for, for me to show you what happens. Sorry, Prof, it, I think you have another five minutes. OK, OK, uh, this is my last slide. Actually. OK, so you have windows and uh, uh, it's not opening. So you have this and you open this. This is what we call transom. So when you have this, you will see that the air change rate per hour double and triple up. So that's how it works. OK, so with that, I think um, Improved physical settings can be an important tool in making hospitals safer, more healing and better places to work. So with that, thank you so much. Um, thank you for listening. And sorry, I actually exceeded a bit of time. <laughs>